Well, thank you for being here this morning for our uh, first service, our second edition for the first service, and we're just excited to see it uh, continue to flourish, and we're just hoping that this will continue to be a just neat resource for our church body. Um, we're going to spend a little time in Genesis this morning. We're going to finally come back to Genesis after our break through Christmas and in the new year. And um, we're going to start with a question that I started with about three months ago, and that is, does Genesis matter? If we didn't know the contents of Genesis, would our lives be any different? I ask that because there are so many people that say, you know what, it wouldn't. It doesn't really matter at all. That's Old Testament. We're in a New Testament age, and Genesis isn't that big of a deal. That's why I'm calling this study of the book of Genesis Foundations, because whether you realize it or not, Genesis is the bedrock upon which all of the Christianity focus lays upon, okay? There's so much of in this book that you need to know. In this book, you have to understand it is written for you. It's not just written for ancient people. This book has been preserved for thousands and thousands of years because God says it's that important for you to know the contents of this book. It's for you. If you can understand the book of Genesis, I want to tell you life will make a lot more sense for you. It fully explains life's structure. It's why we are here. It sets up why life is the way it is. The book of Genesis answers modern day questions, modern day issues. All the big ones can be found in the book of Genesis. You want to know about creation versus evolution? You want to look about marriage, about why we have different skin tones, about the rise of nations, about the community that we have with Christ and with God? All of those things are found in the book of Genesis. In fact, if you are serious about knowing God, then you've got to be serious about knowing the book of Genesis, okay? Okay. So does the book of Genesis matter? It absolutely does. You know why? Because the foundation of your life determines the outcome of your life. And that's why we need to know this book. The outline of this book is easy. We looked at this a couple months ago. It's broken down into two major parts, and within those two parts, there are four major areas. There are four great events spanning over about 2,000 years. The first 12 chapters cover that, dealing with the, uh, the, the creation of all life. It talks about how life came to be. It really explains our purpose, our mission. Then we see the fall. We see the introduction to sin um, and why bad things happen today. The key word that you're going to see in that part of the, of the Bible is the word corruption. The corruption began. Uh, corruption started with a corrupted authority when Adam and Eve chose to go against the authority of God. And then that corrupted humanity itself. From there, we see the world falling under the curse of sin, the corrupted world, and finally, marriage becoming corrupted as well. And so sin is corruption in life. Then we see the flood, which is this gut-wrenching era in history. It's the first full impact of sin's corruption and death. Then we see the rise of many nations and how we have so many people groups and languages. Those are the first 12 chapters, the last uh, so many chapters, 13 to 50, cover about 200 years, and they follow four great people and their families in this intimate walk that God wants to have with people. So we're going to spend a few weeks now getting into the section of the flood, the life of Noah. And there's so much in the story of Noah that we can apply to our lives. When I began this study this week, I ended about Wednesday with about 18 pages of notes that I've condensed into seven. Okay, and so you're, you're going to want to spend some time with this book looking at Noah's life by yourself because I was just drawing so many things out there, but I can only limit it down to a few things because of our time. But there are so many things that you can apply. Um, one person even humorously wrote a top 10 life lessons from Noah that I found online that I thought you guys might like. These are top 10 lessons that this person learned from Noah. Number one, don't miss the boat. Number two, we are all in the same boat together. 
Number three, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Number four, stay fit. When you're 500 years old, God may ask you to do something big. Okay, that's true. Right, Clark? Okay. Number five, don't listen to critics. Just do the job that needs to be done. Number six, (laughs) when investing, remember to float your stocks. Don't liquidate. That's terrible. (laughs) Number seven, for safety's sake, travel in pairs. Number eight, speed isn't always an advantage. The snails are on uh, on board the ark with the cheetahs. Number nine, remember, the ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic by professionals. (laughs) It's terrible. And then number 10, no matter the storm, when you are with God, there is always a rainbow waiting. Now, I want to start by looking at the book of Noah um, with, as we come into uh, into this book, I'm aware of the fact that many of you did not receive your first instructions about Noah from the Bible. If you're honest, I'd say most of you got your ideas of Noah and the ark from what? Christmas, like children's stories, comic strips. Someone even told me that I learned a lot about Noah from Bill Cosby's stand-up act. Everybody ever see Bill Cosby's stand-up act of the book of Noah, all right? Most of us think of Noah as this little, happy, bearded guy with these cute animals popping their heads out of a boat, uh, and it's this wonderful scene of a zoo. Uh, And believe it or not, when we look at those things and we think, what a cute story, when we look at those, we actually, there's a big danger in focusing on Noah's Ark like this. Okay, does anybody know why? Well, it's because we get the wrong idea of what this is about. We think this is so innocent, this is so lovely, this is so nice, this is for kids. We focus on the wrong stuff. And even worse, we can be deceived into thinking that Noah's Ark is nothing more than a really nice children's fable, a fairy tale. And I believe that Noah has been the recipient of fake news more than any other account of history in the Bible. Okay? I took pictures. I, I recently went to the Ark Encounter uh, with my family. It's in Kentucky. It's an amazing museum uh, where they built a full replica. They took the dimensions of the Ark and they made a full wooden replica of, the, of Noah's Ark. And then within it is a museum that shows how this, how this really could happen. And we were there and I took some pictures of a display that tells of seven deceptions that mislead people when it comes to Noah's Ark and these children's stories. Okay, number one is people, when you look at it as nothing more than a kid story, is you, get, you disregard God's word. Most of the cartoons are just cartoons than an actual historical account. It becomes a story and not an account. And there's a big difference there. Number two, the message becomes distorted. It becomes nothing more than a fun boat ride on a lake. Number three, the message is cute. It focuses on animals and not really what happens. Number four, it discredits the truth. It waters it down. In fact, it becomes a point of mockery for critics. You know, atheists will ask, do you believe in fairy tales? Well, so do Christians. Just look at Noah's Ark. Do you see the danger in that? Instead, they say, don't believe in that fairy tale. Believe that we all involved out of random chance. Kind of ironic to me, if you ask me. Number five, it's destructive for all ages. Adults don't learn or study because it's for kids, right? It's a children's tale. So why do I take time? It disorients the reader from the facts. If you look at those little things, it sends mixed messages, citing biblical dimensions of the ark while displaying this image of this tiny little boat, And finally, number seven, when it comes right down to it, it defames God's character. Did you ever think of that with those stories? It defames God's character. Brothers and sisters, we need to get our info from the source. The Bible tells us that this was a real global event of catastrophic proportions where God sent a flood that covered the entire earth, destroying 
every living land, animal, and person except those that are on the ark. Guys, I would not call this story a friendly family children book material. In fact, I have yet to see a children's book with this verse on the cover. Okay? It's a very intense time in the world. In fact, maybe you noticed your bulletin. I, I asked Pat to imagine what it would look like to have a children's cover with a cute boat and that verse along with it. Uh, and I appreciate Pat for doing that. He's so very, she's very creative that way. It doesn't make sense. Okay? It doesn't add up. The main purpose of the flood was not to showcase God's wrath, but rather to show why God saved Noah. That's the point. Noah's life is one of the greatest examples that we have of faith that works. Think about this. What could motivate a guy to build an ark when people didn't even know what an ark was? We have to look at this and remember that we have the advantage of hindsight. These people are saying, they get the message, hey, I want you to build an ark. They didn't know what rain was. There is evidence in the Bible that says it took 100 to 120 years to build this ark. Have you ever gotten discouraged in serving the Lord and wondering how much longer do I have before this is done? Imagine doing this for 120 years before it even happens. This is about faith that works. Noah was asked to do things by God that were so absolutely absurd. But if you really take a second and you look at it, or you use the, the advantage of hindsight that we have, you say, wow, what an incredible example of faith. What an amazing person. This life shows the secret of how to survive disasters, how to live by faith, how to stand strong in a world that is evil and corrupt. We're going to look at that too. We're going to look at how Noah faced the flood and how even one life, when it's faithful to God, can change the world. I don't want you to miss that. I really want you to hear that one person can make a difference in the world because of the purpose of God in your life. You can make an incredible difference in the world even when the world is going a different direction. Okay, so be encouraged. Now let's answer a couple questions here. Number one, The big one is, why a flood? Why did this have to happen? To answer that, we really need to look at the source. We need to look at what's happened up until this point. If we go right into the story and we start talking about Noah and the flood and we get right to the boat and all the really cool stuff, we'll be tempted to wonder why God could be so mean to so many people. If you look at this really at a glance, you can stop and go, wait, man, God is so cruel at this point. He must have gotten really mellowed out as he's gotten when Jesus came to the earth right? No, not the case at all. God seems mean, but I want you to see what's happening on the world. You've got to go all the way back to chapter 4 in Genesis, and you've got to see what happened with Cain and Abel. Remember in the garden, the world became corrupt because it was introduced to sin. The very next thing that we see in Scripture is these two brothers. They have a brand new world. It's very few people as compared to today. It could be whatever you you want it to be. Uh, and, 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 and the first thing we see is this brother killing another. And what I get from this is that it's not like sin gradually got worse and worse as more people came onto the earth. It's not like they started with lying and then a couple hundred years went by and then someone stole a grape and then stealing was, in, it was brought to the, our attention. It's not like this. The very first thing we see is is, is cursing God and murder. It's from there that it gets worse and worse and worse. The only command that we have to this point is that we're to be fruitful and multiply, and we're to have a husband and a wife. We see in chapter 5 how the very first thing that the line of Cain does is they start to marry multiple women. This starts to break God's heart. You see the state of affairs of Adam's descendants, and there's complete rebellion and corruption. You've got to think about sin being like a plague that is spreading over all of the earth, affecting everything. In doing so, it's killing God's dream of what the earth should be. What do you think that did to God's heart? 
It builds up till we get to Genesis 6, and I need you to look at this verse. It says this, because this, this answers why the flood happened. It says, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Mankind had received knowledge of good and evil in the garden, but it has not been a good thing. They were far better off when they had to trust God for the good. But now, every thought was consumed by evil. Just look at that verse. It says, everything they thought or imagined was consumed by evil. It totally broke their heart. This is now a world of Hitler's. An entire world of people who never thought, their only thought was only evil all the time. It wasn't even, it wasn't even like our world today. We see some people today that are trying to do good. We have law and order at least. We're heading that way again. And the Bible tells us that. And the Bible uses the same example of this time and this era in Matthew 24. And I put that in your notes for you to look up later. But at this time, you can't imagine the cruelty on the earth. So you may ask, okay, pastor, so this is where God raises his fist and he slams the world with his wrath, right? Well, that's not what I see in the text. What I see is a picture of a loving parent leaning over a hospital bed, looking at their terminally ill child. The grief and the pain of knowing evil and sin was not something that only people felt. God himself was grieved over it. Remember, God once looked at everything that he had made and said, it is good. And he looked at the the people that he created and said, this is very good. Now he looks over the world and he says what? Everything is totally bad. Everything is completely messed up. Everything is poisoned. And we see God's heart broken. And this in itself is an amazing statement because it reveals the heart of God. He had a difficult choice to make. What we're seeing here is God having to choose to take the world off of life support. Having to pull the plug. The flood was God's tears over the grief of sin, not his wrath. The wrath is the result of the justice that God had to do. Do you know that he feels the same way for you? Do you know that God weeps over you? Do you know that he weeps when you weep? You know, when your life is affected by the corruption of the world and you're left broken and hurt that God weeps over you, did you know that? You have a God who weeps. We see that in Jesus several times in the ministry, God weeping over Jerusalem. We see Jesus sobbing over the death of his friend Lazarus. We see him crying so hard that his tear ducts are releasing drops of blood at the cost of the sin that he will one day carry while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. When you think that no one sees you, you think that no one cares, when you think that you're all alone, you're not. God sees you. God knows you. God feels the pain of sin. He felt it on the cross. Sin breaks the heart of God. And the reality is, is that all of us in this room have been hurt by sin. Some by the sin that we've done to ourselves, by our own choices. That's stuff that we're going to have to own up to. But there are other corruptions and other evils that we have no control over. God weeps over both. But the reality is, as we see in Noah, is that it doesn't end with tears. God does something about it. He brings deliverance. The history of humanity could have ended right here. But God said, boy, if there is just one who hadn't completely bowed their knee to evil, we could do something with that. And he looked, and behold, he found one man. Genesis 6, the next two verses, it says this. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation. I'll make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes, bugs, and birds, and the works. I'm sorry I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
All of a sudden, this guy Noah comes to the scene. So let me answer another question. What's with Noah? Who was this guy? What makes Noah so special? He must have been perfect, right? Maybe, maybe not. Well, let's, let's get it. What we know of him, we get from chapter 5, give us a little bit of his family history. Any of you that's trying to get to know somebody, we got to get to know their family a little bit, right? So what do we know about his family? He's the 10th descendant down from Adam. Remember, they lived a long time in those days. So we're looking at several hundred years past Adam, but he's only the 10th descendant. Noah, anybody know how old Noah was when he had his first three children, his three children? 500 years old, all right? Noah's grandpa was the oldest guy to ever live. His name is Methuselah. He lived 969 years old. His dad, Noah's dad, was named Lamech. He lived to be 777 years old. Okay, why is that significant? As you look at verse 30 of chapter 5, it says Lamech had other sons and daughters. Verse 29, he had Noah, and he had other sons. So we know that Noah had a big family. Noah had brothers and sisters, probably had cousins and nieces. They were all alive when God announced that everyone's heart was totally wicked and evil. What does that say about Noah's family? That they were all totally wicked and evil, but Noah. Noah was the only one in his family to love God. Maybe that's how it is in your family. Do any of you have family members that don't believe in God? Sometimes that's the worst persecution when it happens from our own family members. But the reality is, is faithfulness can be hard, but you've got to stay strong because even one life can make a difference. God says, I'm with you even when your own family is against you. And you get to pray for your family members and trust God and, and ask God to, to, to come into their life. But this is Noah's background. So I ask the question, where does Noah get his influence for God? Who would have taught Noah? The only other person that we know is Noah's great grandpa. His name was Enoch. Anyone ever heard of Enoch? He was pretty amazing. It says this in chapter 5, verse 22. It gives us a little glimpse of who he is. It says, after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Wow. Okay. Enoch walked faithfully with God and then was no more. God took him away. God, Enoch is one of two people who never died on this planet. Anybody know who the other one is? Well, Elijah. Jesus actually did die, yeah, but he rose again. But, but Elijah was the only other person that was taken up, remember, in the fiery chariot? I mean, that's incredible. So most likely, Enoch influenced Noah. How do we know that? Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11 for a really big clue here. It says this. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. But for before he was taken up, look at this. He was known as a person who pleased God. So who would have known that? You better believe that Noah would have known about his great-grandpa, about the influence that he had. And then it says this, and we quote this verse all the time. Did you know this is related to Enoch? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Isn't that cool? We use it all the time. Some of you guys might have it plastered on, a, on, a, on your wall somewhere in your house. Noah was most likely influenced by Enoch to walk with God. And so what I get out of this is I just thank God for faithful grandparents who teach their grandkids and pass down a legacy of Christ to the next generation even after they're long gone. I put on this my notes, what are your kids and grandkids going to say about you? Live in such a way that people are positively influenced even after you're gone. That's what I get out of Enoch. So going back to Noah. What's so interesting about Noah's life 
is the word that God uses for the first time in the Bible to describe what he sees in him. Verse 8, it says this, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The word grace is found here for the first time in the Bible. The first time you've ever seen it. That's important because it's one of the most important words out of all of the words that God uses to describe himself. Here, Noah, in the midst of this perverse society, is one man who finds grace. And I just think of this, how hard would it have been to be a righteous man in a perverse world? How hard would it have been? You can imagine doing anything and everything. There are no laws. Anything is permissible. Do you think that Noah would have ever been tempted to not walk with God? Absolutely. Do you think he was tempted to cheat, to do wrong? Do you think he was ever mocked for believing? Absolutely. Maybe by his own family. Sure. But yet, through it all, God sees grace. Grace is this unmerited favor. It's kindness and mercy. It's the very quality of Jesus Christ seen in the life of Noah. Grace is going to be the major point of God's heart from here on out for the world. This grace is expounded upon in verse 9. And this is where I'm going to end today is this one verse, okay? But it says this, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. These are three things that God tells us right away about what he sees in Noah. When the world might have seen something completely different, like he was a nutcase for building this big thing in the middle of a field, God sees three things in here, and these are what qualify him as godliness. And I I look at this and I say, okay, it's not because he was smart, it's not because he was a charismatic person, it's not because he was a leader in the community, though he might have been those things. I'm sure he was actually shunned in the community. People probably thought he was a weirdo. It's not because he was the master of scripture. There is no scripture yet for him to master. What God saw in him was not about his talents or his education or his social status. He saw a person that loved him, that wanted to walk with him. And I see these three things, and these are in your study notes. These are three points of grace that all of us need to apply to our life to understand what God is looking for and godliness. Number one, he was righteous. That just means that he had right standing with God. That's what righteousness means. He chose to live a life of obedience when the world wasn't. And because he trusted and obeyed, he had happiness with God. He lived by faith. His righteousness was accredited to him by faith. We see that in Hebrews. Notice what first, Noah finds grace in the eyes of God because he's a righteous person. Noah chose to fear God. God said, I want you to build an ark that's never existed before. And something's going to happen about 100 years from now that's never happened on this planet. And you know what God said, Noah said? You got it. I'm all in. Let's do it. It's amazing faith. The question of this is how are we righteous today? If the quality that God is looking for is righteousness, how do we become righteous? Well, you know, it's the exact same way that Noah was righteous. It was accredited to him by faith. And it is today by faith through grace in Jesus Christ, not of your own merit, but by Christ alone that we have righteousness. When we accept Jesus in our heart, Jesus' righteousness is imputed onto us. We are now known by him and not by our stuff. And we have right standing with God. Number two that we've seen here, he was blameless among people. He was blameless among people. His words and his actions displayed his faith to the world around him. It was obvious that he loved God. He was blameless, meaning no one could accuse him of anything other than what he proclaimed because he lived it out. And I long to be this person. The question that I thought of is, can that be said of me today? Can that be said of you today? Do you live your life in such a way that it is clear who you profess? 
I saw a guy the other day who cut me off, and he was just driving like a maniac down 441, and he come around my van, he comes in, and he's just going 100 miles an hour, and on the back of his car, it said Z88, and it said, God is, my, my, God is something about the Lord, and I'm like, man, he's one of us. That's crazy, and he's driving like a maniac. Does our life confess, does the words and the life that we live show the world that we love Jesus? Are we blameless? Blameless is an interesting word that God chooses to use here. The nearest English word that we have for the Hebrew word blameless is the word whole. The word whole. So basically what he's saying here is Noah was a whole person in a broken world. And that's the kind of person that I want to be. Maybe sometimes you're going to need to be that blameless person in your office or at your restaurant or at your work or with your family or wherever you may be. Sometimes you may feel like you're the only whole person where you live or where you're at, but, but you've got to stay that whole person because that's why God has got you there, to be a whole person in a broken world. And finally, number three, Three points of graces, he walked with God. This is a huge statement. You're going to see this statement time and time again throughout Scripture. Walking with God is the way to life. This just means he was doing more than just keeping a set of rules. He was doing more than just going through the motion. This was his passion. He was passionately proclaiming. He was sacrificially serving. He was cheerfully giving. It's used all over scripture. In fact, if you look at his great grandpa, what did it say about Enoch? It says, Enoch walked with God. When you get to Abraham, what does it say about Abraham? And Abraham walked with God. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the same thing. They walked with God. Joshua into there all through scripture. Jump a God a couple thousand years later. Later, and the message is the same for you and I today. If you look at Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. Well, when did he tell you? Way back in Noah's time and every time since through Scripture, this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Enoch was rescued from death because he walked with God. Noah was rescued from death because he walked with God. You and I today will be rescued from death when we walk with God. When we make this our life. The main purpose of this story is not to show why God sent a flood. It's not about animals floating around on a happy boat. This is about salvation. This is the message of salvation. Noah wasn't perfect. He had the same issues as the rest of us. In fact, if you jump ahead into chapter 9, you see how his story ends. It's not a good one. There's one of some shame and some dis disrespect. After the flood, Noah took some fruit of the orchard and he became drunk and ended up naked. Does that sound familiar to anybody else? Is there any other place in Scripture where people in a garden ate fruit and ended up being naked? It's the same problem that Adam and Eve had. It's the same problem that people have had since then. And it's the same problem that you and I have today. We need grace. And that's what God is looking for. We need to walk humbly with God. His right standing with God wasn't based on his actions, but on his heart for walking. That's why he was rescued. It's the same for us today. Our right standing with God is not based on what we do but it's on the gift of grace that is given through Jesus Christ. It's a good thing to remember. We have a lot to learn in this book. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you come back. Bring a friend. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we get to just start by looking at just three verses of this incredible account in history. And Lord, next week as we get into some of the more detailed things of this ark and what it means and the significant symbolism behind it, God, I pray um, that this next week we'll be thinking about those points of grace that we learned through Noah's life. God, I'm thankful for those people that have made a difference in my life. If I look back, I can remember that one person that made such a huge difference, that impacted my way in my life in such an amazing way that I'll never be the same. 
And God, I pray that I would be that person. That in this world of brokenness, that I would learn to be blameless. That I would learn to be whole. Not to tout it over them, but to give hope. And to show the grace of God. God, I'm sure as you look over this world today, your heart breaks. Your heart breaks because of the corruption. Because of the hurt and the brokenness in this world. And yet that's why you sent your son to be a salvation factor, just like the ark. And Lord God, those of us who are saved, we now proclaim the message of hope. We are now standing righteous before you. And I pray that we would walk faithfully with you. God, if there are people here today that have been working on their own efforts to try to figure out life, if they're trying to work on their own and they're missing the boat, I pray that they would receive you as Lord and Savior today. If that's you here today, would you receive the gift of grace? It happens when you by faith accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You confess your sin to him. You allow him to dry the tears. He will forgive you of your sin. He will lead you in righteousness. He will be your salvation. You must confess, repent, believe and receive. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.